And so, as your knight plunges his gleaming longsword between the wings of the terrifying red dragon, thus saving the princess, the orc army goes scattering back to their dark lord. And you've once again saved Kingdomonia from a powerful threat. Ugh. Today on WebDM, we're talking about cliches in 5th uh, in edition Dungeons and Dragons. So we're gonna adventure in a dungeon and fight a dragon. Yeah. And not be cliche about it. Yes, yeah. so we're talking about those things in Dungeons and Dragons that have crept in over the years, those yeah. meeting in taverns and the orc invasion and all those things that veteran players will roll their eyes at, snooze, mm. boring, yeah. done this a million times. Yeah. What we can do to freshen those things up and maybe identify some of those cliches for the newer people who are, you know, coming into role playing games in Dungeons and Dragons. You know, their first year, they wanna yeah. they wanna uh, you know, avoid some pitfalls or something. So uh, I like a good cliche because it's classic you know well I mean cliches are only cliches because there's something that people like they get told so many times that you just already know the story before it you're like oh it's that one huh right but right. we've been doing that with stories for thousands of years <laughs> right there's a couple things going on number one it, it, they're cliches because they're done poorly and, and they take the easiest route to portray something or present a challenge or a scenario or something. It's either done poorly, it's done haphazardly, and this can be forgiven, right? Yeah. Very few dungeon masters are professional storytellers, uh, myth makers, linguists, you know, all these kinds of things. None improv of us, actors. Improv actors. Like, all of these things are, are kind of the job of the DM, yeah. but we've got day jobs. We've got other things going on. Dungeons and Dragons is not our life as much as it really is kind of our lives. Uh, <laughs> we can forgive the dungeon masters of the world in the 40 plus years that Dungeons and Dragons has been around for developing cliches that get used uh, a whole lot because they're convenient and easy. Yeah. That's probably why you want to use them they are classic they became cliches for a reason they were popular or they they evoked some kind of emotional response from people they liked them because you know everybody uh, pretty much makes the the orphan origin <laughs> you know parents were killed and now right. I just blah 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 right I can't tell you how many of my characters do that but sometimes you know why not start the adventure with a uh, full family? And that's, you gotta support them and you know, you're a family man. Let's run through a couple of a couple of cliches and go through different ways to subvert them. Here's the one I'm thinking of and maybe you're thinking of something similar. Yeah. Starting in a tavern. In a tavern. Beginning your campaign in a tavern. Just having drinks. Having drinks, sitting around, yucking it up. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're gambling, maybe there's some carousing going on, a yeah. fist fight. And then somebody bursts in. Somebody bursts in. The there's a call! The quest giver shows up. Right. It, it's played out. It is played and out. And it's a, it's a joke that your yeah. character, you know, that they would They're meet. They're in a tavern. That they would meet and start in a tavern. Right, right, right. Let's kind of think about it for a minute. Taverns are places where people gather. Yeah. It's perfectly uh, natural and, 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 and very relatable. Uh, yep. Kind of beginning. Uh, it's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> I look at myself. How many times have I find myself in a tavern? At least three times a week. At least, I, right? I quiz, I quiz twice, <laughs> and I play D and D in a tavern. So right. literally, me as a person but, goes to a tavern three, three days three, three out days of the seven week. days a week. Uh -huh. So am uh -huh. I living a cliche life? Maybe. Or am I just living my life? It depends on how many mysterious wizards come in and give you a quest that changes your life. Well, it's happened a few times. And start you out on the hero's journey. Oh, man, yeah. I'm a fucking cliche. <laughs> Here's what you can do to liven it up. First yeah. off, you can change the environment up. The purpose of the tavern is that it's a central location that's familiar to everyone. It's a touchstone. Right. So maybe you don't meet up in a tavern. You meet up at a fair or a festival or a yeah. town square or something like that. The tavern is just a convenient excuse to have the characters together in one spot relaxed, they're not expecting combat, and yet yeah. at the same time there's a lot of stuff that they can do as they're working out who their characters are, waiting for the, the plot hooks and, and everything to sort of drop. Mm -hmm. Switch that up, maybe it's a tournament that they're meeting at. The player characters are either participants in the tournament or spectators or something like that meeting yeah. someone. Or you can go back and you can say, well what is it about meeting at the tavern that appeals to me? It, it's rustic, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. It's 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 close. It suggests uh, characters who are low level, who have concerns like eating and drinking and living in a place. The tavern kind of channels all that, and 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 you can have it, uh, you know, be something that that leans into the cliche. Mm -hmm. Says, you know, yeah, that's uh, that's perfectly fine. You guys are meeting in a tavern. That's probably what you guys do. 
three days a week, <laughs> right? <laughs> or it could just be an alcoholic. That's true, but you don't have to. You don't have to be in a tavern to drink, though. That is true. Thank you. Yes. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Another cliche, of course. There's a tower, and in that tower is a princess. Yeah. And and around there, probably some kind of beast or dragon. Some kind of beast or dragon, or a wicked witch or stepmother or something yeah, yeah. that's keeping her locked in. The 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 princess in a tower is one of those where I, you know, a big surprise, surprise. Uh, a game like The Witcher or a setting like The Witcher, the, the Witcher stories, which I've just started to read, sort of tries to subvert those things and says mm -hmm. like, all right, these are the fairy tales, but what if they were real and what if they were real monsters and what if there was a monster hunter out there to take care of them? Yeah. I, you know, the princess in a tower, it could easily be a prince or some other kind, or a diplomat, or mm -hmm. something. The point of it is, is that it's a it's a person in a tower or imprisoned some way, in which they can't get out themselves. Mm -hmm. And maybe they've been unjustly imprisoned, or maybe they've been justly imprisoned. What if what if the princess in the tower is there because she's not a particularly good person, and keeping her locked up is sort of keeping everyone else safe. Yeah. But her agents out in the wild have spread the rumor that the mm -hmm. innocent princess has been wrongly imprisoned by her wicked stepmother yeah. and she really needs to be set free. Yeah, because um, what, what if she's a little bit more in lines with, uh, what's her name, Elizabeth? Uh, Bathory. Bathory, right. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the bloody duchess or whatever, <laughs> I don't know, I forgot what it was called. Right. You know, they can't kill her because she's somewhat royalty. Yeah, sure. They but can't they just, have got uh, to keep her the fuck away from right. people. <laughs> right? Because she's going to just keep bathing in the blood of milkmaids. And maybe the, the characters catch wind of this uh, at rumors and as they get closer and closer to what they see is like, well, if we rescue the princess, then we'll win her hand in marriage and become princes of the realm and blah, 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 mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but as you get closer, they sort of uncover the mystery and realize, well, maybe this person that's being imprisoned isn't quite so yeah. good. Or maybe, maybe it is. Maybe Maybe the fact that they've been imprisoned uh, it suggests a problem in the kingdom or the realm. Changing something about it, changing yeah. either who was imprisoned, why they were imprisoned, or the conditions uh, around that imprisonment. Or what about this? What if, yes, there's a princess, there's a tower, and uh -huh. there's a dragon, but the princess is an evil sorceress and she has imprisoned a silver dragon and keeps this story going out so adventurers show up. <laughs> Just so she has something to feed her dragon that's imprisoned. They get up there and they're like, oh, we're going to defeat this dragon. They get there and they're like, why are you chained up? And then she hits him. Right. Oh, right. thank you. I don't have to go out and find food today. I don't have to go out and find food today. A lot of times you just hint at a cliche or something. Uh -huh. The players will run with it expecting something going off of assumptions that they bring themselves. This is metagaming on the DM's part. Oh, yeah. It's fine. It's how you build interesting stories. Yeah. Uh, and meta, there's nothing wrong with metagaming, full stop. And, and so the players start expecting something. They bring their own assumptions. They vocalize those things while they're discussing it. The DM's listening to what they're having to say, mm -hmm. adapting his campaign or her campaign to what the players are doing. And now all of a sudden, the players are expecting one thing. You flip it on them. They realize that they've been making the wrong assumptions about stuff, that, that the way that they've been approaching this has been... Uh, in error the entire time, yeah. and now they've gotten themselves in a sticky situation that it's harder to extract themselves from. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how you, it's honestly how you deceive and lie to the players and make them <laughs> make them their own worst enemies, sort of practicing DM judo against them. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have to use their own expectations and assumptions against them, because if they only have one clue, yeah. And they try to extrapolate to the end. Yeah. Well, you, you might need to get a one or two more clues uh -huh. so you can triangulate that shit. Yes. <laughs> you need to feed them enough breadcrumbs that they keep going and feel like they have information, but not so much that they have a full and clear picture about what's going on. And right. The gaps that they're filling in are where they start to stumble and make wrong assumptions about things. And then as they get to the climax of the particular adventure or campaign or whatever, they realize that they've been making some wrong assumptions. Now, it's that's difficult to pull off. You can easily yeah. get in a situation where the player's like, I have no idea what's going on, and the DM's being stingy with information. This is a delicate act of yeah. feeding the characters misinformation and build and letting their own wild expectations get the better of them. But it can be done. So, sometimes the DM can do a bamboozle. <laughs> yeah. So an another cliche, uh, especially in this day and age of television and film, uh -huh. The zombie horde. Good grief. Everybody's got horde. a zombie horde, Everybody's right? Everybody's got a zombie horde. And they're fast zombies, they're slow fast, zombies. Fast, slow, they puke, they run, they jump, they've got spikes, they're yeah. noxious. Uh, yeah. you, know, I, I, you know, obviously, the, the one, interestingly enough, zombie horde that I'm less concerned about and actually kind of excited of seeing is the one that's, uh, that appears in 
the later seasons of Game of Thrones. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's a well done one, just because the villains are interesting, the dilemma is interesting, the world that it inhabits presents this challenge as an interesting one. A zombie horde like that in Dungeons and Dragons is like, well, we've got like 20 dragons on our side and a bunch of wizards that'll come around. and. That kind of zombie horde in a typical Dungeons and Dragons setting is like an, a challenge for an afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, less a an existential threat to all civilization itself and more kind of a nuisance. If they're just regular ass zombies like Walking Dead, uh -huh. and then you just drop some wizards and whatever in there, like they're gonna start mopping that up pretty quick. Quick. They're going to start mopping it up. So how you how do you do a zombie horde in Dungeons and Dragons that makes it interesting or makes it uh, you know so a, a genuine threat? And I have used them in the past in conjunction with something else. So I've used a zombie horde in the past after the realm has been weakened by years of famine and drought, which has led to widespread death. Which means there are a lot of unburied bodies in abandoned villages that there's no one there to put up a defense against this thing. And every uh, victory for the zombie horde feeds its army and the zombie horde is being led by vampires and liches and ghosts and things like that it's a whole necromantic threat not just a, a horde of the shambling dead mm -hmm. you can do it sort of in the wake of a war or something you know yeah. there's a massive war that's come through untended battlegrounds and dungeons and dragons would be terrible things right a battlefield is already kind of a bad thing uh, yeah, medieval disease. battlefields disease uh, uh, pickers that come by after the battle looters and pickers that come by afterwards uh, uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, it attracts carrion eaters and other eaters of the dead, ghouls and things like that. And what if in the wake of a massive war with all these unburied bodies or mass graves or something like that, all of the death and concentrated, uh, you know, dying and negative energy cause uh, undead to spontaneously rise. And now the players have to deal with spontaneous pockets of undead rising up. And it could quickly get out of control because instead of one massive army of the dead marching south, it's a lot of little fires. Yeah. Of undead that keeps spreading that you're completely surrounded by that you're completely surrounded by and and if the army and if the realm has already been uh, weakened by pervasive war and death and things like that, which usually comes with disease and famine and and all those other uh, fun things, mm -hmm. uh, that's how you do it. So I find zombie horde is a good complication, not necessarily the centerpiece of a campaign, but something at, that arises as a consequence of some other kind of calamity. I remember you did that in uh, in our fourth one of our fourth edition campaigns. Yes, yeah. This was a big problem with the the undead, but they weren't the problem. The people drumming and controlling them were the, were the problem. real problem, right? You know, so it became a thing about avoiding the zombies altogether because uh -huh. there were just too many. Yeah, like they—I yeah. mean, they were literally everywhere. Everywhere, right? And it's you know, a bunch of fourth, three or third or fourth level characters aren't going to take on an entire horde. Right. But that one guy drumming over there? Yeah, the one guy who's... who's that looks like they're, he's controlling them? Yeah. That becomes an exercise in getting to him. Right. And around every... I don't know. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, another one. Where are you the are? Dark Lord. The Dark Lord. Yes, the Dark Lord. The evil, big, bad, evil guy yeah. who rules from the Dark Tower and, yeah. and does... So why does this work in Middle-earth? It works in Middle-earth because Sauron is a part of the mythology and the creation of everything. Omnipresent across thousands of years and is yeah. the enemy, yeah. right? Very often in Dungeons & Dragons, that's less the case. And the Dark Lord type character is often there just for the campaign. They're not embedded into the world and meshed in it. Yeah, like they're, they're more trying to become a dark lord trying to become a dark lord uh, you know you can avoid that I think by by having the dark lord <laughs> be uh, either a myth or a rumor something that a cabal of equally nefarious but maybe less mystical mm -hmm. uh, adversaries have concocted sort of a yeah. story that they've made to present and now everybody's afraid of this dark lord but it's really just a figment of fiction yeah. uh, uh, perpetuated by something else um, you could lean into it and say yeah this is a dark lord and the king that this this dark lord rules uh, this realm that it governs is a nasty horrific place and the people there are oppressed and and it's not a a pleasant place to be but you need to take that seriously how do they deal with the neighbors that they live with yeah what do they do for trade for food it still has to be a functioning society in some way uh, otherwise there the, there would be no power base that this dark lord could draw no one there to feed its armies no one there to uh, you know to pay the taxes yeah. that it's extracting uh, from the from the populace also the dark lord at some point needs to have experienced a defeat in the mm -hmm. past and they're just lying in wait lying in wait same with Sauron, uh -huh. uh, Voldemort. Voldemort's another good Harry one. Potter series. Right. You know, mm -hmm. he was this thing. He got defeated. Oh, he's oh, don't worry, he's gone. 
Yeah, you yeah. Know. Or even the Emperor and Darth Vader from uh, Star Darth Wars. Vader. You know, they, they have weaknesses. You know, maybe it's weaknesses like Darth Vader has weaknesses, which is like, you know, they it's the weakness is the emotional attachment to, to the people who stand against him. The, there's a magical weakness or something like the Horcrux mm -hmm. that, uh, that the party needs to exploit and find in order to overcome the, the Dark Lord. But I think like having that one massive brooding kind of dark evil figure that's irredeemably evil or yeah. wicked or something like maybe they're not maybe and the best villains don't see themselves as villains and see what they do as a type of good yes and so maybe it's entirely possible that the rumors coming out of the dark kingdom are of a horribly oppressive place where everything is is terrible and horrible but when you visit it's not set not that bad yeah. Uh, and, and there is a reason for several of the things that are happening. Maybe there is a greater threat that that kingdom is fighting off. And so that has to be a little harsher. Yeah. It has to be a little bit more brutal. Um, or maybe they look at it and say like, no, well, guess what? I don't see myself as a wicked person. I see myself as the lawful ruler of this land. These are things that are mine by right. And I have an obligation to the, to the subjects of my land that I take care of them. And in return, you know, they, they give back the fruits of their labor kind of thing. And, and yeah. making the villain more three-dimensional and its motivations a bit more um, murky yeah. can, uh, can, can really subvert that cliche. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, hell, you could wrap them all up together and the party gets over there to take on a Dark Lord, but it, you find out that he's just trying to protect his kingdom from an invading zombie army that is being <laughs> controlled by the dragon that stole his wife and is uh -huh. hiding her away just, in a tower. You learn all of that while starting in a tavern. And you learn all that while in a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> from like, a mysterious wizard. From a mysterious from wizard. From a mysterious wizard. Um, and the mysterious wizard is a great, is another great cliche. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's the, that, no, the idea of the wizard who has all powerful, but it's just like, like whatever that com that comic is of the wizard, like, hand me that book. But the book, it's, <laughs> it's just, just right, right there. Give me the book. Just give me the book. Because <laughs> that's kind of what it's like. Right, right. Right. But they have better shit to do. They have better shit to do. So why is that wizard running around all mysterious like? like mm -hmm. uh, seeking aid from first level characters to go do stuff. Well, there's a variety of reasons. Maybe it's busy. Maybe it's not the real wizard and it's like a projected image or something like that. And the real yeah. wizard is dealing with shit yeah. elsewhere. Uh, maybe the wizard is just uh, powerful by reputation and not necessarily by actual deed. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can subvert it. I, this is one of those cliches that I don't really tend, I don't like to use that much just because yeah. That kind of quest giver, here's the character, here's the plot hook, I'm gonna shove it off on the PCs, is not something I usually like to do. I usually like to include powerful NPCs uh, that have some significant weakness that only the party can help shore up. When you find yourself either as a DM or a player saying like, you know, what I, the character I've got or the idea I've got for a scenario or an adventure or something, man, it's kind of cliched. I find that it's best to go back to the source. Mm -hmm. What is the origin of the cliche? That, that you're using or that you may have accidentally fallen into and examine that. Because I find very often when you go back to the source where these cliches originate, you find something fresh and new and interesting, something that's multifaceted and with depth that as it's been copied over and over and over and over again ad nauseum, that it's lost that. So an example I'm thinking of is Conan. Yeah. Right, like Conan for a lot of people, uh, less so maybe than in the past, is a dumb barbarian who has a great sword and a fur loin cloth and he grunts and, and he punches camels. Punches camels and hates magic and is just kind of a big dumb bully, you know. But reading the original Conan stories, he's much different. And his savage upbringing, born on a battlefield, uh, raised in the hills of, uh, of Samaria, and, and, and that, that upbringing that he has imbues him with a savagery that civilized men lack. Yeah. And yet he travels through the civilized lands, getting into scraps and adventures and thefts and heists. And he's a pirate captain one story, and he's in a mercenary company the next. Yeah, yeah. And now he's off here fighting Picts and other sort of other barbarians and then the next minute he's fighting Stygian cultists and those stories are evocative and feral and yeah. primal and you see Conan in a variety of different ways and if if the Conan you're thinking of is lumbering towards you muscles bulging with a giant sword then the real Conan is lurking in the shadows behind you and you don't see the knife that he's got that you're about to be gutted with right so Lord of the Rings is another great one yeah it's been copied so often and and the the, the amount of fantasy literature that has grown out of the Middle-earth stories it's worthwhile to go read the stories don't watch the movies they're 
great. I like them. They're fun. But they also have a style to them that's a little played out. Yeah, they're action movies, kind of. Right. They're fantasy action movies. Yeah, like going back and like rewatching Fellowship is it's a fun movie, but at the same time it, it's aged. And yet going back and rereading Fellowship is a different thing entirely. And you spend time with the characters and you see the world building going on. And right. Don't skip the songs, read through them. Those are the kinds of moments where if you're wanting to freshen up a cliche, going back to the source. Yeah. using that original source as inspiration and forgetting all the derivative stuff that's come after can be a good way of, of livening up a cliche or giving you a fresh perspective on it so that you can then subvert it in a different way than maybe it's been done. I don't know, I don't know if we might have to edit this later or not, <laughs> but kind of the, 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 the main hook of Tomb of Annihilation, that's, uh -huh. that's w what it is. I mean, everybody kind of knows that there's a magical disease and you can't be raised back. People right. who were previously raised are being affected and they're sick. Yeah. Well, guess what? You get implored by a wizard who's sick. <laughs> right. Who literally can't go adventure. Can't go do that. Yeah, yeah, normally in any other day, they just go do something about it. Yeah. But no, they're literally sick and losing hip, hip points every day. Yeah. And they need someone to go do this thing. To go do this thing. And that's a good way to to let the player's expectations sort of propel uh, the action of the story because then it's like the player should be thinking to themselves, if this wizard's so powerful, why does they why do they need us? Yeah. Which must mean that they maybe either are not as powerful or there's something else going on. And so those are the kinds of questions that players should be then asking themselves. Yep. Why in the world is the this NPC acting this way? And the DM if they're thoughtful, if they've given their NPCs proper motivations and, and fleshed them out, they will be able to answer that question. And it's in asking that question, why is this powerful NPC approaching me for aid, that they can start, the players can start to piece together clues about the threat that they face. Why in the world, in the great city of Orakala Palantine, would a, would a powerful wizard ask a bunch of lowly sixth level people to help it kill a demon? The answer to that question is, Obviously, they cannot do it themselves. Yeah, they could, they, and revealing that information reveals a key weakness for them, mm -hmm. and that there's something that the party or the players need to do, need to help with, uh, and and it's vital. And maybe they, you know, the NPCs don't want to reveal that information and reveal mm -hmm. their vulnerabilities, but the players can piece together the clues and go, okay, uh huh, yeah, uh huh, okay, and then they can start. Uh, in piecing together those clues can learn more about the threat that they face, learn more about their allies, and, and sort of develop an appreciation for the campaign that the DM's trying to run for them. Well, there you go.